find thee to fail. Thy mercies are tender, how firm do the end. Or make her defender, redeemer, and friend. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Reading from the 25th chapter of Matthew. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come. You who are blessed by my Father, take up your inheritance for the kingdom prepared for you since creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you tended me. I was in prison, you came to visit. And the righteous will say to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you, a stranger, invite you in, or, or naked and, need, and clothe you? And when did we see you sick in prison and go to visit? Verily I say this unto you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. He will say to those on his left, depart from me. You who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I thirsted, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I was naked, and you did not clothe me. I was sick, in prison, you did not look to me. Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and didn't help you? And verily, this is the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And they will go into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. A word from the Lord in the house of the Lord. This is probably the easiest thing in the world to preach. All I need to do is read it over six or seven times until you really have heard it for sure, and then I'd be done with it. But we look, we look back to Ezekiel. Ezekiel was pretty much the last of the major prophets, and God said to him, you know, tell my people that I will treat them like my sheep. Now, we, we get in our mind a movie where they have a herd of sheep that's covers the whole hillside, and, and they ride around on horses with five or six dogs to, you know, we, we think of the sheep ranches out west here. But there they had, if you had 100 sheep, you were extremely wealthy. Which is why when he uses the example of, if there's one out of 100 missing, won't I go find him? Won't I go find that one that's lost? Because in their economy, in their circumstance, every Sheep was a treasure. And they couldn't afford to lose a sheep like that. And they were very careful with them because they had rocky mountainsides to, to graze on and the grazing was pretty poor. And there were places a sheep could fall off and get stuck in a crevasse or, or get hurt going, rolling down a hill. The sheep are not the smartest animal in the world. But sheep are generally loyal. And he talks often about that the sheep will know my voice. That the sheep always know the voice of the master. And the master can call the sheep and they will come. Because they depend on the master for their good health and their good situation. So it's a give and take kind of a thing when you've got sheep. Uh, we had a huge flock of sheep. I think we had 18 or 20. We had the nastiest ram in the world. He hated me. And he was faster than I was. 
No, I had to be sneaky. We had a draw that ran through the pasture. I'd get on the other side and tease him, and he'd come dashing after me and fall off into the... <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that's a, that's a side story. That's another whole story. But, but the, the, the value of the sheep was so much greater than, than we can see it and imagine it because it was everything to them. They made their clothes from the wool. Yeah, the older ones got eaten because sooner or later they would get old enough that they couldn't survive anymore. And so, you know, it's, it, it, you have to... Now, may I, may I divulge? I haven't told this story in a long time about the salesman that stopped at the farm and there was a three-legged pig. And they said, what's the story of the three-legged pig? Smartest pig in the world. Smartest pig in the world. We had a fire in the house. That pig got out of his pen, came in, woke us all up, and called the fire department. Pressed 911 all by himself. Smartest pig in the world. He said, okay, but why three legs? He said, that pig is the bravest pig in the world. We had robbers come, got out of his pen, came into the house, subdued the robbers, and cornered them until the sheriff could come and get them. Bravest pig in the world. He said, yeah, but what about the three legs? He said, when you got a pig that's that smart and that brave, you don't eat him all at once. <laughs> Not a good story, right, Dominic? <laughs> I don't even know what that illustrates, but it ought to know. But we, we, you know, we're so used to talking about sheep in the Bible because Christ keeps coming to us as a shepherd, and he keeps reminding us that we need to hear his voice just like the sheep know the voice of a good shepherd. And the good shepherd worries more about his sheep than he does anything else because the sheep are what provide his family with life. So he, if he's missing one, he will find it. He will not go to bed at night without knowing exactly where all of his sheep are. And I said, when, if you had 100, you were very wealthy. Most of them had two to three dozen sheep. And that was what their family had. So we move on from, from Ezekiel's story, though it's an important story, remember, in that God said, I will be the judge of the sheep. You tend them, I will judge them. And that's what, that's what we sometimes forget. We, we, want to be, we want to be sure that everybody that got the 108 or 9 or 10 turkey dinners Thursday, we want to make sure every one of them needed it. And I'll guarantee you 20 of them didn't. But I don't know which 20 they were. That wasn't our task. Those who helped pass out the turkeys and the, and the, the fixings, we didn't, need, we didn't even have time to judge, but it wasn't our task. Our task was to feed the sheep. Our task was to tend the sheep. I know, I know that people come to the food pantry who aren't in need, but there are a lot of them who are. And if we miss one person who's in need because we're being judgmental about those who are not, we're not tending the sheep as Christ called us to do. He found every sheep. Then he would judge them. Not before, but then. Jesus said to the crowd around him, he said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. And I'm reminded of those, those words every time we do our rummage sale. I mean, it's getting to be hard work and it's getting to be tedious. And, but on Saturday, when we see people packing everything they can into a Walmart bag for a buck, and I know 20% of them don't need to do that. But 80% of them do. 80% of them are finding a treasure that there's the only place they can get it because we're the only ones who provide it like that. And I look at them and say, well, she's well-dressed and he's well-dressed and she's not and he's not. No, no. 
Not my job. Not your job. When he was naked, we clothed him. Because when the least of his people are naked, then we clothe them. And by doing so, we serve Christ. Uh, we feed 35 families a day some days. Yeah. Every once in a while, somebody will take something they don't need. We're not, we're not, this is not being broadcast, so nobody will know, right? Oh, we have a, we have a handicap sticker in our car. And once in a while, I pull into a handicapped parking place because I'm in a rush to get in and out, and, and it isn't for me. And so, legally, I'm not supposed to be there. And people look at me like, there's nothing wrong with him, but I'm old. That ought to count for something. <laughs> See, if I want to, I can justify anything. If I want to, I can excuse anything. If I want to... I can make it all right to be unfaithful. And that's not what Christ is talking about. He's talking about being faithful in their any circumstances. We drive by the people with a sign that says, out of gas. On the fourth day I see them there, I think, should have got a five-gallon can of gas by now. Or we're not trying very hard. I'm judging, not giving. I'm not telling you you have to give. I'm not saying that that's what you need to do. But we need to pray for them. We need to love them. If you don't believe them, don't give them the money. That's what it's about. When did we do something for the least of his? When have you just spontaneously done something for someone? That's when he's there. That's when he's vital. That's when he's alive. That's when he gets in your heart. He asks us not to be judgmental. And then he tells us to judge wisely. For he knows we're going to evaluate. See, there's a difference. See, being judgmental and evaluating. Evaluating is a higher level word. So it's a, it's a, the, it's a seminary word. Evaluate instead of judge. Do it because it feels like you ought to do it. Because every time you do it, you do it for the Christ. Yeah, you're going to make mistakes and, and bless people who are already fully blessed. You're going to, going to make mistakes. But make a mistake of omission, not one of commission. Do, do for the people who you think might need it. Do for the ones who need to be loved. Do for the ones who are outcasts. Do for the ones who have no hope except that people around them will care. We, we got the greatest lever on feeling good of anybody around. All you have to do is spend an hour or two in the food pantry. All you have to do is, is show up on turkey day. All you have to do, there's so many places that we have the opportunity to blatantly do what Christ says to do quietly. Remember, he says, don't be the one that prays loudest in the square. Be the one who prays, prays quietly to the God who loves you. Yeah, we see, we see people in prison, not necessarily on, in cells, but in prison of poverty or in prison of greed or in prison of anger, all sorts of prisons. And it's our task to visit them, not to fix them, not to make them perfect, to visit them, to let them know that Christ is real, Christ exists, Christ lives, and because of him, so do we. Ezekiel said, God will separate. He didn't say man will separate. He said God will separate the good from the bad and take care of it. He asks us to treat everybody as our neighbor, 
to love them as we love ourselves. Not because it's what we have to do. It's what's right to do. So when you see someone in trouble, at least pray for them. Beyond that, you're on your own. I need to quit parking in parking places I don't belong. Because somebody may need it. I'll try. You try too. To touch the lives of those who are lost. Who are hungry for the word. Who are in prison of their own making. And Christ will bless us. Each and every one. And those we touch. Equally. Amen. I forgot what we're singing now. My Hope is Built, number 368. Oh, you don't have a book, you can't do that. Would you stand with me? We don't sort the sheep, we feed the sheep. We don't criticize, we bless. Because we can, and he calls us to do it. So let the blessing of his love flow through us, because in giving it away, we get to keep it. Go in peace. Go in his peace. Amen. And let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be. With God as our Father, Fair.
family in perfect harmony. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every breath I take, let this be my song vow to take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth and let it be. You guys want to do that?